I was trying to, I was in too much into the silence, so I thought everybody can hear me despite having no microphone. So good morning, good afternoon, buongiorno, buon pomeriggio. Welcome to our almost uh, fourth day of book presentation. As you see, I'm, I'm losing days and hours. We are very happy today again to have a very special book presentation on, on topics that, uh, that are very dear for us for many reasons. We will see why. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Anna and Charles for accompanying us today with the book presentation. And um, let's start already in. So, um, Anna, your book, which is Early Cinema Modernity and Visual Culture, The Imaginary of the Balkan, is also very related in, in many ways to our Ruritania program, uh, but in general of many topics and ideas that have been going around, but I, we feel hasn't been uh, properly addressed as you do in your book. So uh, first, you would like to introduce the book a little bit? Yes, um, buonasera, hello to everybody, good evening. Um, grazie Paolo, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm honored to be here today, and I'd like to thank uh, Jay Weisberg for inviting me um, to be part of this very prestigious <laughs> um, Incontri Film Fair. Um, I'm also very nervous, as you can see. So anyway, this is the first time I'm talking about this book. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy to see so many of you here because it's actually beautiful sunshine outside <laughs> and you're actually joining us um, for this kind of discussion on books and there are numerous people I'd like to thank um, that for which this book wouldn't have seen kind of the light of day but I hope that I've I've done that in the acknowledgement so I won't go through all the list right now um, but uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, cin cinema is kind of a form of storytelling and through moving images that I think we all love so much here, I'd like to begin with a sort of a, with a story of an encounter uh, that I had last year in the Epirus region. So together with a Romanian film historian, Marian Tsutsui, we traveled to Greece and North Macedonia last summer. And this was to attend also the opening ceremony of a newly built um, uh, cinema theater in Bitola, North Macedonia, um, where a doc documentary by a photographer called Robert Jankulowski will be shown um, about the Balkan cinema pioneers, um, as some of you may know, so the um, Manakiewicz brothers was being screened. So we took this opportunity, and for me the first time, to visit Milton Manakia's grave, as well as go to the native village of the brothers, um, up high on, uh, in the Epirus Mountains called Avdela. And if anybody has ever been to the Epirus Mountains, um, maybe some of you have, uh, you have to take a very long, uh, windy road uphill to get there. It takes a really long time, so it's a sort of a pilgrimage of a sorts. And um, on the descent from the village, we encountered a shepherd um, with his flock of sheep. He was returning home. We stopped the car, of course, to talk to him. Um, and film him and uh, photograph him. And perhaps rather unsurprisingly in the Balkans, for some of you that have traveled there and know it a little bit, he belonged to the ethnic group of um, Aromanians, of Lax, and um, he had traveled and he spoke, of course, Aromanian. This is a Romance language, somewhat similar to contemporary Romanian and, of course, perfect Greek and Albanian, and he also sang for us. Um, <laughs> so this situation of linguistic 
cultural and ethnic diversity is commonly found throughout the Balkan region, even nowadays. And this was even more the case during the the time, the period on which my book is based, so you know, the kind of turn of the century, 19th, 20th century, and during the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires. So returning to my book, and this is a question uh, that I ask myself, I ask myself, how does even, a, you know, how do you attempt to begin to write a sort of all-encompassing or even representative early cinema history of the Balkans, given this kind of cultural, ethnic, and linguistic complexity of the region? I mean, this is nothing more than, uh, nothing less than a Herculean endeavor, if there ever was one, um, at least that. So when I started working on this project, I was confronted um, with no less than a dozen countries and almost as many languages, which for the most part are mutually incomprehensible. So which rendered this task, let's say a task uh, which for a very modest uh, early cinema historian, somewhat an act of madness. <laughs> And this also reminds me of my meeting with now my dear friend, but also Bulgarian film historian Petar Karjilov in Sofia in 2013, which was one of my archival trips, um, of whom I told about my project at the time. And, um, and I remember him remarking this and being very surprised and saying that, you know, you have to be a little bit crazy to do this. <laughs> Um, so, if anything, I think the present work is the result of this healthy combination of uh, passion and madness. And maybe this will resonate with some of you here, um, <laughs> how we feel about early cinema in general. And I think, can I have a few more words or oh, yeah. if I'm going on, Please. you just interrupt no, no. me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think as, it, as Dina Yordanova has argued, you know, writing about Balkan cinema is very much about connecting nowadays a disconnected space. And so my methodology is informed uh, by this kind of conceptual, if you like, mapping of the geographical and imaginal space that designates the Balkans, both to allow a kind of connection between what has survived in terms of visual um, and textual artifacts to emerge as a kind of sense-forming constellation. And in terms of my methodology, I rely on a reading of primary archival materials, but as well as secondary sources. And actually, this is one thing is that my approach does not privilege uh, the moving images or the surviving moving images, fragments and visual materials over archival texts. But what I hope is that these um, kind of enter into dialogue with each other. And I will stop because it's a very long introduction. <laughs> and I don't no, know Paolo, <laughs> perhaps to speak. Thank you. Yes, I will, I will be myself uh, brief in question because i think and i hope there will be a lot from uh, definitely from the public as the topic is very very um vast and that's was interesting uh, one of your chapter is exactly what you were mentioning before is called uh, mapping constellation uh, right because i think uh, by correcting me if i'm wrong that there was um as you expressed before there is a combination of uh, many differences, of course, in the Balkans. Also the idea of exotism. Therefore, there is a lot of stories and a lot of backgrounds that come from both. So um, just, just to give us an idea, what were the things you were trying to map? Which um, inside of many chapters is many stories, but I don't know if you can give us a glimpse of some. Um, certainly, I think, okay, so I should probably mention the story of the Hungarian cinematographer and producer Luis Petrov de Beri, whose films you, you actually, I hope, saw as part of the Ruritania program. So this is one of those stories that I map uh, because he was very instrumental in the making of uh, first uh, films in, in, in Serbia at the time, but also he traveled later to Bulgaria and was also the uh, founder, if you like, and the diffuser of film culture through a Pate magazine. So this is one of those things where you have, uh, you know, a kind of multiple, this is just one of the stories and or already previously mentioned uh, Manakia brothers, which were extremely important, not only to map, to document uh, the important events, uh, just, you know, at the turn of the century and the beginning of the 20th century, but they were extremely important for the, you know, history of 
both this kind of decline of the Ottoman Empire, that changing landscape, they have you know, this incredible ethnographic footage of diverse communities living um, in and around the Epirus region and beyond. Uh, so they are, if you want, part of multiple um, national film histories today. Um, and you can really truly say they were, you know, a tr transnational kind of filmmakers. Absolutely, uh, there is so much again in the book, and and then you um, there's many things you talk, for example, about a cinema exhibition, which is very interesting as well, but also about how was on one side the Balkans were used or looked from outside the Balkans, which was the general ideal mythology of that. And at the same time, how they look from the inside. How was the filmmaking in, inside? So uh, on, on the first part, as we come back to the Ruritania program for sure, uh, this mythology exotism inside Europe and uh, this, this uh, complexity is, is very fascinating, I must say. Oh, <laughs> I'll let you, I got you what you're going to say. Um, yes, absolutely. So I think one of the things that I also try to do is to perhaps offer an alternative um, narrative um, in the book. Um, of course, this um, exoticism or uh, Balkanism, if you like, or um, a sort of semi-Orientalism, if we take Todorova, or Orientalism, if we go to Said, um, was being constructed uh, both um, and mainly, of course, from the outside, but you know, this is also coming from within. So I think it's important to um, to note that, of course, you know, one of the things was to to look at these because I'm going uh, to the archival sources. I'm trying to kind of look at them from you know our perspective of today, of course, and from the reading um, that we can give, knowing um, the kind of um, not only you know the advances made in other scholarship in terms of new cinema history, but also post-colonial studies. And I think this really helps to give a reading uh, which goes beyond uh, a kind of you know Eurocentric or Western-centric or a story which is like oh we were still catching up or you know the Balkans is the other it's on the periphery. So what I'm trying to I think one of the things I'm trying to highlight and, and argue in the book or attempt to do is that this kind of vernacular modernity or an alternative modernity that was going on is precisely can give us this this new way of thinking about development of early cinema the influence um, in general of cinema and visual culture and modernity in spaces that are peripheral that may be interstitial and for me this is the richness that we can gain if we are not using the same paradigms and the discourses which originate from the center yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to stop here to see if there is any question already from the public, if somebody has some comment or question in general. Yes, please. I've got quite a long question comment, actually, so maybe somebody else would want to say something before. I think, I think it's okay. Please. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, Anna, congratulations on the book. Um, for people who don't know, my name's Stephen Bottomore, and I've been writing about early cinema for years and years, including in the Balkans, and the, especially the, the British filmmakers who went to the Balkans in the early years. So the two, I've got really two things to say. One, slightly negative, which I'll begin with, and the other, much more positive. The, the, the negative thing is that there's a lot of film theory in your book, or at least bits of it, and I think it's utterly unnecessary. <laughs> and as you probably, some of you know, I've been fighting against film theory for my entire career. Mm. I think it's an um, unwanted excrescence in the body of film history, and I think it should be utterly eliminated and killed off. Um, <laughs> and I think there are quite a few empiricists in the audience and in the festival who might well agree with me. So I don't think you needed it at all. And the actual content of the book is, is really quite extraordinary. And I don't think there's another book that covers the Balkans in such a overall way, in such a total way, looking at so many different countries and bringing together so much research. Um, 
I've read it and I made two or three pages of notes. Um, possibly a lot of this material isn't unknown in the sense that it could have been available already in uh, Balkan languages, but I don't speak Balkan languages, and there's so many of them. Um, so I don't think I think it'll be new to a lot of people, and there there are all kinds of accounts you've got from the 1890s, from a theorist of that time. I approve of theorists of that time, <laughs> um, and f from all sorts of other um, material. You've even got um, uh, a something that was completely new to me and unexpected, which is you, you found an account of a, the first play, the first uh, dramatic play from 1897, written by two Germans, Austrians, Blumenthal and Kardelberg, um, which the original title is the same as it was in the Balkans, Hans Huckerbein. Um, so, yeah, again, a big surprise there. You've missed out one thing that I've found, which is the first um, ever filming of a war, which was in 1897, by a British war correspondent called Frederick Villiers. Um, so I hope that'll go into the next edition, and I really hope there will be an, a, a next edition, because it's, and everybody should both be buying this book, I think, who represents an archive or a library, because there's nothing else that covers the same material. So what I'm, I guess my final comment is, and I think it's going to be the same one for um, the book that Charlie will be talking about, is that this kind of thing should go into a second edition or even an online edition where one can add new material as it becomes available. Let me also add that uh, there is a special discount. So if <laughs> <laughs> I take your word. Uh, so whoever buy it here has a 20% discount. If you go to our, uh, upstairs there is flyers in our uh, film fair. So you're more than welcome. You see there's two people already pushing you to buy it and there's for good reason, I would say. <laughs> um, I don't know if there is any other comment or quick question. Well, we should make one comment, which is that Stephen yeah. Baltimore, for Stephen Baltimore has offered you the most largest compliment imaginable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you should feel uh, uh, like very pleased and honored by that, even if it sounds mixed at times. <laughs> no, th thank you, Stephen. I mean, we can agree to disagree about <laughs> theory, <laughs> but I, I'm very, I'm very grateful for your comments, and I'm, you know, I'm happy that somebody has read the book. <laughs> and thank you so much for the support. Just a, a quick question. Um, I'm curious about how much we know in terms of distribution exhibition practices um, within the Ottoman Empire of films from um, countries that were still under Ottoman rule and those that had uh, become independent like Romania um, uh, beforehand. Do we know, for example, exhibition practices in places like Izmir, which had such a large Greek population? Um, yeah. Thank you. So I, I think um, for, for this kind of work, I would like to point you to um, a, a Greek historian who has worked on this, uh, Arkolakis. Um, and particularly, he looks at the, you know, Asia Minor Greeks, particularly, you know, these networks from Izmir, you know, going to Greece, to mainland Greece. Um, so it's not something that I cover as much in this book, given the language. Um, and given the difficulties of, of, the, of the large territory, I, I do say a little bit about it. But I think the other scholar as well uh, that's absolutely looking, um, for instance, he's looking at uh, the presence of Pate in, in Istanbul is Nezi Herdogan. So there's a few people that I can definitely um, recommend uh, that will be a, a lot more, uh, how can I say, expansive and knowledgeable on the subject and that have actually looked at, you know, so some of the first, uh, some of the first uh, Greek film productions were actually from, from the Greeks coming from Izmir uh, that we know, of course. Is there another last quick question or comment somewhere? Okay. Thank you. Um, I've done research on two pioneer families, both of which have uh, visited the Balkan. 
And uh, one family is called, uh, the head of the family is called Heinrich Hirt Senior. You may or may not have come across him. Oh, sons and daughters traveled the Balkan countries. The other family traveled. Which uh, the Thank you. Um, I'm. Thank you so much. I would like to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, thank you so much. I'm. Uh, I'm not tackling either of those families or or in in this book. I mean, this is like I said. It's the Balkan as as the region. So not everybody is represented in the book, and not everybody will be. Um, kind of represented to an extent that you perhaps uh, would like to expect. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm focusing on is a s kind of selection and representative examples, but I would love to talk to you afterwards about both of them and your research. Thank you. Okay, uh, there was maybe some last one or not. Um, well, I do, I do have a very brief one as well. You mentioned at the beginning of the book how important it was to get access to the archives and uh, all the sources in the archives. And um, for sure, I mean, again, we were talking this morning in the Collegium session, how uh, digitization is helping that kind of access. Um, do you think that uh, research can be broader to archive um, even outside Europe or more? Uh, that might have even more materials, as the Balkan maybe didn't have uh, enough uh, luck in preserving everything, as other countries as well. Um. Oh, definitely. I think there are plenty of archives um, around Europe that have materials related to the Balkans. I mean. I think it's always a question of, you know, um, somebody going and looking and being interested in these materials. Um, and the other thing is, of course, the question of funding. Um, I think there is still a lot, a lot of materials in the in film archives across the Balkans that merits, you know, further research. Absolutely. Um, and, and further kind of contextualizations and readings. And, and I'm not talking only about the moving images, but about, you know, kind of all the other extra filmic materials. Um, of course, the majority of the press uh, at the time, which is still largely unexplored, is in, you know, various institutions. So I think this is, this is the place to begin, of course, but yeah. For sure, I think you know you have instances um, of finding films in other, oh, as we can see from the program yeah. here as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Anna. It was thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And now we switch to one of our delighted books, and we'll thank uh, Charlie that we here and everybody who can join. This is the book that the donors got, but it's still uh, very important. And it's the chronology of the birth of cinema. And you will see also from the date that it's very large, longer, and full with a lot of beautiful uh, picture pattern, a lot of things. Uh, so Charlie, what, what do you think, we were just talking the other day a little bit, what do you think there is inside, what do you think there is missing also that we well, were talking a little bit about? Uh, the thing that's missing most of all, of course, is Dick Rizel. I mean, he really, it's really too bad he's not here and we can have a conversation with him. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I was thinking, oh, maybe we could get him on Zoom and, and do it that way. But uh, apparently, and I think rightly, you know, it's like we need to encourage people to, to actually come to the festival and not take it. Li live it vicariously, but uh, so yes, we're missing Deke Rizel and uh, and I think a robust conversation about this. You know, w w one of the things that's missing, which I think is interesting, is uh, well, the title itself is really interesting, right? It's the kind of throwback, the birth of cinema. I mean, that uh, you know, that that's that that's the kind of thing that used to really get my uh, my my cackles up uh, in in the old days, you know, like it's you know, cinema is not a it's not a, it's, it's not an organism, it's not a child, it's not an animal or anything else. It's like, tech, but uh, it's it's interesting that it's it's chronology of the birth of c cinema, 
It's not a chronology or the chronology. I mean, if it was the chronology, then he'd be in big trouble because <laughs> there's many different chronologies. And on the other hand, he's not quite ready to admit it's just a chronology. So I, I thought the absence <laughs> of that is, is in a way uh, significant. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a chronology. And uh, I mean, there's so many ways of thinking about early cinema or pre-cinema, I should say. Uh, you know, um, and, and really anything before the beginnings of cinema is pre-cinema, right? So like that's taking on like everything, politics, culture, not just, but it's, it is a kind of, um, it is a, a, a fairly narrow and focused history of a technology of the creation, the illusion of, moment, of movement of what's sometimes called persistence of vision in various forms, beginning with uh, Plateau's phenokistoscope in 1833 and then through really the first year of, of, of cinema. Um, and, you know, one could argue, for instance, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, it, it could be that, that it should maybe extend it to 1897 when there is the first, uh, you know, Stephen would want it to extend it to 1897. And there would be reasons for that. Like, for instance, the first screenings in the Philippines were in early 1897. The first war films were made in 1897. So it's, it is, you know, uh, in some way uh, are arbitrary, the, the ending and, and likewise the, you know, the beginning. Um, so it's, it's, for instance, what's not in here is like uh, a chronology of the development of photography. Um, you know, that's it. it. There's moments when it appears uh, because it's relevant, or he feels it's relevant um, uh, to 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 this uh, this chronology of the history of persistence of vision. Or, or so um, so yeah. So that's uh, you know. I mean, I, I I've I've also tackled this. I think in in the in in the old days uh, we were maybe like we'd start you know arm wrestling over which was the proper chronology, and I, I think now it's. You know, I think that there's a variety of chronologies, and and each each has their strengths, uh, and and perhaps their weaknesses. And and this certainly has many strengths. Uh, you know, it reflects I think, De Grozel's passion, uh, something you, and, and also his rigor. Um, and you know, I think, um, you know, he he's he's, uh, you know, we're looking for a Richard Brown replacement in terms of like particular eccentricities, and Deke seems to be right up there, you know, there's a, <laughs> uh, you know, so there are certain things he can't resist, or there's certain things that he's exhaustive of. I mean, I think every Edward Marbridge uh, exhibition that he can find, he gives, is, is given in the chronology. Um, Marais uh, appears a lot, um, and Anschultz, Altamor Anschultz, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But, you know, so then there's like some intriguing things in here, for instance, and this is something I had never thought about before. But there is a Thomas Anschutz who's working for Moybridge in 1884. Same last name as Adamo. And, and then suddenly this other guy appears. And, you know, like, you know, was this a, like a, what was their relationship? Or was it just coincidence? You know, so, I mean, this chronology raises all sorts of, I, I think, interesting questions for, for, for all of us. Um, and, 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 the, and, and the chronology is filled with, I think, uh, useful, provocative, uh, information, uh, I mean, as, as someone who tries to make sense of the names of various uh, projectors or, or exhibition services in the, in, in, in the U.S., you know, these many of which are clearly coming from Europe, uh, it really helps to, to, uh, to, to, to make some suggestions about where, where they may have come from. And it, it is also a very international um, uh, book, uh, may, maybe particularly uh, oriented towards favoring the UK and Germany, uh, and then maybe Paris, France as well. But, um, but in any case, uh, it's just got a, a lot of uh, really interesting material. Um, yeah, one can, um, you know, there are there are moments where, like when one is working solitarily, we all know this. You know, where little little blindnesses, uh, fit, uh, you know, appear. But um, you know, that, I think that's you know. As Stephen was saying here about second editions and even online things, um, you know, one one could think about that. But it's it's a fabulous, uh, really a wonderful achievement, and it's something that, you know, I encourage everyone to to get their copy uh, of. Um, yeah, it's 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 a. It, it deserves to be in the donor bag. Yeah, and we have absolutely. to thank John Libby once again for yeah. producing a wonderful book. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, not only of course the content is always, but we appreciate uh, the how books look like and these as you can if you can have a chance of browse too there is a lot 
of beautiful photos, but also a pattern of machinery and so. So it is not only a chronology, but there is really um, a specific technical content, which is amazing uh, because I bet how difficult that would be to find and, and in general to be, uh, when you're researching on this, how many um, you know, how many ways you have to look for to find the exact information or the closer information you can get. And as you uh, can all imagine, uh, we already have problems after uh, 1895, but even before that is even more uh, difficult and can be sporadic and, and difficult to gather information. So it was definitely uh, a great achievement. Is there any question or comment already from somebody? Um, so you were saying, you know, there's been plenty of chronologies, <clears throat> none of which can really be considered like the definitive chronology of early cinema or the birth of cinema. Um, but would you say that across the board, there's any really significant gaps in what we know? Is Are there things that really need attention or need to be studied about pre-cinema and early cinema that haven't been touched? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we were just talking about uh, that, that may maybe it's time for the Giornatas to uh, the cinema muto to close down because it's all been done. Uh, no, of course, there's huge <laughs> amounts of things. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, right now, for instance, I'm working on a, a, another chronology. I mean, you know, and when does chronology become history, right? I mean, you know, uh, but a, a history of documentaries long durée, uh, which goes back to about 1700. And so there's a lot of things going on after 1833. I mean, for instance, the, uh, the use of the album in, a process to, to transfer a photograph to glass, a transparent surface, mm -hmm. which is you know obviously a key thing uh, when you're talking about cinema. But that's not something that interests him because it's not involving you know this synth this synthesis or illusion of movement. Uh, so so he doesn't really like pursue the history of photography and you you know and and likewise, although he will talk about how the, some of these. Uh, um, technologies will be presented in, in lecture form. Um, you know, he's not really interested in the illustrated lecture, which is like a, you know, a, a kind of before the documentary, there's illustrated lecture, but then, you know, which involved lantern slides, but before illustrated lectures with lantern slides, there were illustrated lectures with all sorts of other media forms. Um, so, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, you know, a fascinating, to me, a fascinating technology. I mean, a chronology, uh, you know, I sort of got my uh, teeth cut my teeth on like arguing for a history of screen practice. Uh, and again, you know, he's not interested in, in, in editing, you know, one, one still slide against another still slide or anything like that. You know, the history of, of the magic, you know, it, it intersects at certain moments, uh, but it's not what he's concerned with. So, it, you know, he really keeps it very narrow. And, and it is true uh, that, uh, you know, one of the things he, he does extensively is deal with patent, uh, 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 patents and submission and, 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 and other things and and, and that's that's really interesting the, the number of patents for uh, motion moving uh, kinetographs uh, whatever cinematographs that don't go any place you know by people we don't know anything about or that were actually submitted by like Henri Jolie but came in under a different name which which he reveals so there's a lot of you know very valuable information in here I mean I think that needs to be emphasized thank you and there was another one there. Yes. Hi. So th thank you, Charlie. Uh, and I, I think you've sold the book. Uh, but my question is, how does a chronology help us resolve for, uh, various disputes, especially that concentrate 1894 to 96? And you know the ones I'm referring to. So we suddenly have all of this attention to Le Prince, who disappeared. We have his footage online. We have the question of the Lumiere looking at the prototype in the French magazine of the kinetoscope, and then was the cinematograph working basically from Dixon's drawings, and then we have the Dixon versus Edison, who do we credit? How does the chronology help us with those disputes? Can the chronology keep the disputes alive, or does it have to c come down um, resolving the disputes? Because it is, after all, announcing that it is a chronology. 
Yeah, but I don't think it claims to have absolute truth. I mean, you know, like a lot of these arguments are in between the, the, the moments, but, you know, sort of identifying the moments and seeing what's around them, uh, I, I think can be really useful. I, I mean, you know, I, I think this chronology, like every time I, I think of this all the time, you know, Bert Akers, R.W. Paul, Dixon Edison, you, you know, I mean, collaborate, Armat uh, Jenkins, I mean, that, that collaboration, partnership is like essential in, in the late 19th, uh, century, early 20th century, and um, and 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 these these partnerships that you know keep on popping up, and then right it gets, you know I, it was interesting that Jenkins I, I learned in this uh, at least according to Deke that Jenkins claimed that he was the sole uh, inventor of of the uh, of the phantoscope, uh, and in my you know in my memory of reading you know and and I'm a little rusty here right but. Uh, you know, that, that Armat sort of said, yeah, we, we, we basically came up with the same idea simultaneously, right? It was like, you know, it's like impossible to separate one from the other. Um, and, and then he, he, he suggests that uh, Ar Armat bought Jenkins out at a very early date and that Jenkins was then showing things illegally. But, you know, at, much after he says that that happened, you know, the, the Raff and Gammon were pleading with Armat to, to buy to buy out Jenkins, and, and uh, you know, so so apparently from their point of view, they hadn't done it. So I, I think that there, you know, there, there there are a lot of things here that that one can uh, pursue. Um, some of these aren't things that uh, are pursued so easily. There was nothing. He didn't document any of the conversations be between W. K. L. Dixon and Antonia Dixon about about like how to invent the kinetograph, for instance. Uh oh, know. it didn't occur to him. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, um, you know, I, I mean, also his, a lot of his sources are, you know, um, the, the, you know, the, the, there's a certain time lag, right? So, you, you know, you need to, to talk to Deke. <laughs> he, he's watching from his home, I hope, so maybe. <laughs> oh, ho. <laughs> well, so. well he, he, that's the problem, not coming to the Jornata. You never know what can happen to you. <laughs> No, I think, uh, uh, as we said, uh, I think the book is as deep as as it can be with with the perspective of the author, which ultimately is what most of history books are, definitely. And I think he, uh, the, the intent was to give as much information as possible, which is absolutely, I think, what, what the book does, for sure. Any other uh, comment or question? Uh, just a quick uh, comment, really. Um, I think I might have mentioned before I'm an empiricist. Um, so uh, I ha the reason I didn't come up there to comment on Deke's book is that I haven't read it yet. But you can be sure of one thing, which is that Deke never wrote an inelegant sentence in his life. So it's going to be a real pleasure to read. Um, and you can be sure he's looked at all the evidence. How he interprets it is... Um, another question. Uh, well, I think of it just one other point. He's going to be publishing with two other authors a book on um, Bert Akers in the near future. So I think that's going to be addressing another dispute, uh, you know, the Akers Paul dispute. So that's something to maybe look forward to. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I think probably those people who really know that period can read some of the chronologies, uh, you know, between the lines where, you know, Acres is 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 mentioned solely or 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 whatever. But yes, uh, I'm sure, um, you know, it'd be interesting. I mean, that that that's it. I, I mean, you know, Stephen, actually, this is a lot of things here are telegraphed, so it's not. Deke's elegant sentences are not, don't get as much chance to develop. There's a really elegant introduction in which he writes about uh, mo movement in the Magic Lantern sort of before 1833. Um, but again, you know, he never mentions the, um, the Phantasmagoria, you know, which certainly involves, uh, you know, all, all kinds of movement. Um, so, so he is, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a book that has a, a certain kind of rigor, and that's much of its charm, actually, I, I would say. Um, 
and, and usefulness. I, I mean, because otherwise, you know, that just sp spirals out of control. It could be a five-volume chronology or, you know, a pre-cinema. Okay, is there a really last one or question or comment? Because we still have a little spotlight presentation otherwise. No? Okay, thank you very much, Anna and Charlie, for being here. <laughs> so, yes, we have the last of the last, which is a special spotlight that we're going to give to Maggie Jennifer and Laura Horak. Even if the DVD is not ready, we cannot have, thank you again, we cannot have this edition of the Jornada without talking about the incoming Nasty Woman. will join us when she arrives. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, tell us all about it. <laughs> so we are very close to see the DVD and the Blu-ray, right? <laughs> it is coming out December 20th. I brought over a hundred Cinema's First Nasty Women t-shirts with me in my luggage, which is right over there. So if you haven't gotten a t-shirt yet, stick around. As many of you probably already know, Cinema's First Nasty Women is a four-disc DVD Blu-ray set featuring 99 archival silent films with all new original music sourced from over from 13 archives and libraries, spotlighting only the very nastiest women in the history of cinema. So in many ways, it's a seamless um, transition from the, the birth of cinema chronology that we were just discussing. And um, we're, uh, we launched in 2017 with a program of five screenings at this festival, including Leontine, Catastrophe in the Kitchen, Catastrophe Beyond the Kitchen, which are still themed sections on our DVD Blu-ray sets. You can pre-order your copy from Kino Lorber uh, to the US and Canada, but once it's released on December 20th, if you'll notice right around the winter holidays, it will <laughs> ship internationally and it's region free, zero ABC, so you can play it in any territory. And uh, let me, let and me the, hand my <clears throat> And there's um, subtitles in English, French, and Spanish as well. And there's um, an incredible 116-page booklet that many of the folks in this room have contributed to, some essays about uh, different stars, about programming content that has uh, like racist gags in it and how to deal with the complicated past, and really detailed program notes about all 99 films. The DVD set also has incredible video introductions and lots of audio commentaries, again, many by people in this room and at this festival. Uh, the Giornate was one of our key partners, as well as the Women Film Pioneers Project, an amazing website that you should check out. It's growing every day. And uh, FIC Salente, which is an incredible silent film festival in Mexico that everyone should go to in Puebla. And who um, they have supplied late November this yeah, year. They've supplied Spanish language um, audio commentaries as uh, as well as um, working to get the set out in Mexico and Latin America. And um, we have a, a FIC Salente Collective member in the audience. Yeah. Who's a collegian. Yeah. So raise your hand if you've contributed to this project in some way. We have hundreds yeah. of audio oh, commentary yeah. music. Look Thank at you. you. Yes. Yeah. Alif, you want to say something about it? <laughs> There's so much to say. Yeah, I mean, talking about music, I think an unprecedented number of musicians worked on this uh, DVD box. And not all, all of them are, you know, well-known silent film musicians. So I think this is also going to be an interesting place where you can discover different uh, musicians from different styles, different countries, and so on. We try to be really diverse also in the selection, although we did try to favor, again, women, because also uh, 
you know, doing this work, we were also noticing that there were actually only a few female, you know, established silent film musicians to choose from, and then we were kind of aiming to expand that by giving the opportunities to these people to do their first job, probably, <laughs> with silent cinema. Yeah, we have more than 43 composers and musicians, and over 80% of them are women and non-binary. And uh, we also tried to emphasize black and indigenous and uh, composers of color. And I'll also say, if you don't know already, maybe you do, but 99 films, about half the set is uh, women comedians, you know, slapstick, knockabout, hilarious, incredibly funny. About half the set is cross-dressing women in all kinds of different genres, thrillers, action, also comedies. Um, so you get really a huge range also f of cinema from, what's the first one, 18... 1898. 1898 till 1926. 26. Yeah, so you get a huge range of different kinds of films from different countries, um, but all of them have these spectacular women's performances. And there are so many unidentified performers who were still on the hunt for... Yeah, I get to work, you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need your help if you want to join the collective. We yeah. still don't even know who Leontine, who Leontine is. So if someone wants a project, why don't you please find out. Now, in fact, this t-shirt project, as you can see, is Maggie's way of putting Leontine on the milk bottle, you know, so that everybody knows. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we can say a few things about that because in the course of years now, uh, not only we were selecting the films, compiling them, of course, also depending on the availability, you know, getting them from the archives, many archives participated. So, you know, like, thanks to all of them, that was great. Uh, but on our side, we were also working on kind of, you know, lists, basically. It's like a giant Excel sheet, uh, trying to improve and add the metadata, you know, like, what can we say about each and every film? you know, the director, you know, the usual things, the year, the company of production. And we found that for many, many of these films, um, basically the metadata that was known and around there is very substandard or conflicting and so on. So there's also been, you know, especially Daniel, Daniel maybe we should now mention, Daniel Hoffman has done loads of work to try to compile the best data, to verify things to, you know, go through different language sources and so on and trying to establish. So hopefully we've done a good job there, I hope so, but we also definitely noticed that there's still so much to be done and corrected and uh, checked. Yeah, Cinema's First Nasty Woman is definitely the tip of the Nasty Woman iceberg. So there's <laughs> so many more films. There's so much more information to find, people's lives and careers to find out about. I mean, it was... We really tried to focus on uh, people and films that had not gotten much attention, that hadn't been released commercially, um, that hadn't had you know books written about them, and so there is hard to access. Yeah, hard to access. Good quality with music. Yeah, so there's I. We really are hoping that this inspires you know many more nasty women projects. Yeah, we were very inspired by Marianne Lewinsky's DVD, Comic Actresses and Suffragettes, um, which is the Cento Any Fa retrospective from 1910 to 1912 that played in Bologna. Um, and that's where I first saw Leontine on Marianne's DVD. And then really the rest is history. Um, but speaking of, I, I mean, this project has gone through so many different phases, right from its initial conception vis-a-vis -vis Laura's and my dissertation <laughs> projects when we were way back in grad school, now to this kind of massive collective undertaking that we never could have done just among the three of us. Um, but the next, some of the next phases in the project, Laura and I are co-editing an issue of the journal Feminist Media Histories that was founded by Shelley Stamp and is now edited by Jennifer Bean on the topic of um, curating feminist film archives. We're doing more research now about um, silent film audiences today and the kind of changing demographics of silent film culture and spectatorship. It seems like these festivals get younger and younger um, and more diverse every time, every time I come to, to retrospectives like um, uh, Portanone and the Bologna Ritrovato. And that's really interesting and that's a larger conversation we wanna have. So submit, everyone submit to our special issue. And if you have anything you want to say to us or if you're already working on stuff around demographics, if you're working on some silent film festival and have some interesting things, observations you wanna share, just uh, let us know. You can send us emails after the festival too. 
and bring these, this collection into your classroom. It's meant to be taught. The booklet, the print version comes with a Blu-ray, but the whole 116-page booklet is open access and will be widely available online. And we have four DCP programs that are touring worldwide, but um, if you're interested in programming Cinema's First Nasty Women at your local theater, please reach out to us. We'd love nothing more than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There is time for at least one question or comment, a brief one, but yes. We would just keep talking indefinitely. That's why they call us nasty women. <laughs> I don't believe there is no question or comment. Then I, then I just want to add about this programming. I mean, it's your opportunity if you are programming a small festival or you know your local cinema or something. This is really a nice deal because instead of going to these 10 or 12, how many different archives, you can just go to Nasty Woman and then say, you know, like of these 99 films, I want to show these five or 10 or whatever. They're kind of, you know, partially licensed to be shown in this way, which is really so much easier. Raise your hand if you're just here for a t-shirt. <laughs> 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 oh, <okay. Yes. laughs> well, they are really good t-shirts. So. They are indeed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we've got the other one here. Yes. The Texas guy on. Yeah. Writer. Okay, then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So All see right. you tomorrow for other book presentation, our last day in Italian. Thank you again.